The government proposed, and we agree, that you should spend a term at the university there to learn the language. But, no buts. But I'm really rather happy at Cambridge. Not to mention I've just been cast in a wonderful role. I know, but... I thought no buts. The investiture of Prince Charles in 1969 was far more than just a ceremony. It was a culmination of a carefully planned strategy to propel him into the affections of the public. And as we'll find out, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. I'm Laura Jackson, and this is Beneath the Crown. The world nowadays is used to seeing and hearing Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales. It was a different story prior to his investiture in July 1969, as the 20-year-old heir to the throne had been a largely unknown quantity in the eyes of the public. But then it dawned on the struggling monarchy and government. Maybe this shy young man could be used as a powerful PR tool for them both. The royal family were being left behind by a cultural revolution that put youth and modernity centre stage in the swinging 60s. The Labour government was also in trouble as the rise of nationalism in Wales risk eroding their support, with the Welsh National Party, Plaid Cymru, having its first MP, Gwynfor Evans, elected in 1966. I therefore declare Gwynfor Richard <laughs> Evans duly elected. Mr Gwynfor Evans said that no English party can now regard a seat in Wales as being safe. A plan was hatched to introduce Prince Charles as the Prince of Wales, despite him taking on the role over a decade earlier. Charles would win over the masses prove his Welshness and cement his position as the Prince of Wales through a televised coronation-like ceremony known as an investiture. Good, that settled him. But first, there was the small matter of whisking him off to Wales to learn the language. Hello, Gimru. Welcome to Wales. In April 1969, Prince Charles enrolled for one term at the University of Wales in Aberystwyth. There, he studied Welsh culture, history and language ahead of the investiture date of July the 1st. Time was running out to master the native tongue. Ow. Uh. Ow. Uh. Ooh. 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 Glide into the ooh. I'm trying to glide into the ow. Fine. Security fears due to the growing Welsh nationalist movement's use of aggressive and violent methods led to 70 police officers being placed in and around the university. Some were even deployed to work undercover as cleaners and students. Everything seemed to be going surprisingly smoothly until Prince Charles was about to give his first major public speech in Welsh in late May. A large group of protesters rose from their seats to heckle him when he arrived on stage. The young prince cut a lonely figure but the protesters were soon driven out by the unlikely combination of police and elderly ladies wielding their handbags. Charles's dignified response drew appreciation from the audience and calmed his nerves. The speech itself went down a treat. <laughs> With one month to go until his investiture, a media blitz kicked in as Prince Charles was interviewed several times across British TV and radio. It was an attempt to launch him into the hearts and minds of the British public as the leader of the next generation of royals and heir to the throne. It's a dual sort of upbringing one has to try and do. And I think perhaps that I've gone to school and university and everything in a, in a, in a much more normal way than any of my predecessors did has, be, has been an experiment in, in uh, royal education and of course it has been slightly difficult. He came across as a more modern, sensitive and relatable royal than people were used to. He was also able to convey his love for Wales. When I first arrived I, I wanted to get out you know, as much as possible so I went and, and went for drives through the countryside and walked in the mountains, exhausted my poor policeman walking up and down the rent and uh, I've seen a lot and I've been very touched by the, the way people have you know responded and, the country people particularly. While his relaxed manner and humour disarmed many, the government was concerned that Prince Charles may be growing a little too sympathetic to the Welsh nationalist cause. I think the fatal attitude to take is to say that these people are wrong, you know, therefore, you know, they mustn't be listened to or, or, or heeded. But I think that what one must try and do is, first of all, establish a personal contact and actually speak to the people and understand what it is they're trying to get at. And a basic sympathy, I think, is needed, and understanding. 
preparations for the investiture ceremony at Carnarvon Castle had been causing plenty of headaches inside Buckingham Palace. Several senior members of staff preferred a traditional approach, but Lord Snowden, Tony Armstrong Jones, had been brought on board to modernise proceedings, including the clothing and stage design. This looks super, I must say. I'm absolutely plain slate. But the important thing about the desk is so that the cameras can come in from behind and from in front. A disc of Welsh slate, impressive in its simplicity. This was the stage where Wales would receive its own prince. As the big day approached, security concerns grew. There had been numerous bomb attempts designed to cause chaos, but the night before the investiture, a bomb carried by two activists exploded prematurely, killing them both. During an enormous security and surveillance operation, Prince Charles's investiture went ahead as planned, and the crowds were out in force. The ceremony was faultless, with the Queen investing her son with the symbols of his office. A coronet for sovereignty. The crown design by Lewis Osman was controversial at the time for its modern look. It's been widely claimed that the orb at the top was in fact a gold-plated table tennis ball. I hope and trust that in time I shall be able to offer my own contribution. And to do that, I seek your cooperation and understanding. Speaking for myself, as a result of my two months stay in this country, I have come to see far more in the title I hold than hitherto. I am more than grateful to the people of this principality for making my brief stay so immensely worthwhile and for giving me such encouragement in the learning of the language. The reception to the ceremony and Prince Charles's speech was rapturous. A global audience of 500 million people, including 19 million from the UK, watched on television. But while the investiture itself was a success, the question remained. Was Prince Charles really cut out for the prominent role the royal family needed him to play? I have a beating heart, a character, a mind and a will of my own. I am not just a symbol. I can lead not just by wearing a uniform or by cutting a ribbon, but by showing people who I am.